So let's talk about the final step in this, which is like party simulation, the other sort of really classic capability that Navisworks is quite, quite good for you and how you can use that. And here's the idea behind party simulation. You've got this model, you have all these different objects that hang around your model. What we'd like to do is actually just associate a timeline of activities with those and just sort of simulate what's going on as we go ahead and build the whole structure up. Okay, so let me kind of show you an example of what that looks like and then we'll kind of look at how we go through and create something like that. So again, I apologize that you don't have it on your side. Let me go and open something on my side that actually has it. And let's see if I can kind of give you an idea of just really where we're going with this. So I'm going to go ahead and just open this one as a starting point. I'll say no, I won't save changes to my class protection. Okay. And we'll go back and take a look at this building. So the idea is we have a building here, and this is our little low-rise kind of architectural thing. It's the thing I sort of started out with in Navis was so I was trying to export it before. But we've gone ahead and added a little bit of information to this because there is still that whole model tree. This building I know a whole lot better, so let me kind of even kind of show you around on this building. You know, the whole uh, first floor, second floor, we can kind of look at individual elements and only individual levels, we can look at the columns, or whatever it is that we're interested in looking at. Are each of the different levels? Or oh, all the different, oh, what are those? Oh, window pieces. All sorts of different pieces that are floating around in there. But what we would like to do is actually go ahead and do a little bit of simulation. And what we do is we actually take all those different elements, and what we do is map them together against a timeline. Let me show you what that looks like. Timeline is the tool for doing this. And what I've done at a really high level is just gone through and put together what I'll call a really simple timeline. Now, for my 4D simulation, I didn't want something that had a thousand activities. I was willing to have over 20 or 30 activities to sort of describe it at a real high level. So I set up a really basic little schedule, which is just like level one, we'll put down the floor slab and the foundations, and we'll put some columns up, and we'll put some beams up, and some joists, maybe put a second floor on it, and start erecting the building one layer at a time. But really kind of at that level. Okay. Again, you can get into this at an incredible amount of detail if you want to, but you know, kind of do it at the high level first and really get your head around it before you... You know, go down. You don't really need to sort of think about things minute by minute. You might need to do that if you're sort of simulating a very small construction operation and trying to understand it in great detail. But at a high level, maybe activities that are two or three days big at a time is big enough or a good chunk size. Think about the chunks that make the most sense to you. Okay. So as you go through and set together a timeline, the idea of putting together a timeline and that timeline, that schedule activity data can come from any number of things. It can come from Primavera, it can come from Microsoft Project, it can come just from Excel. I tend to just do them in Excel as a CSV file, but it can really be just whatever it is. All you really need is task names, start dates, stop dates, and then you're going to associate activities with those tasks. And so at a high level of that, yes? Yeah, and what we actually do is you can go to a data source and actually go through and point to, I actually have this Timeliner data source CSV file, and I can sort of pull it and kind of upload it. We'll do that together in just a second, and then we'll look at that. But for right now, that, yeah, that's where it comes from, it's a CSV file. So with all the different activities and a task timeline, which you can do is then, say, make a simulation and kind of watch the building get built relative to that task timeline. And where that comes, let me kind of show you where that is. Just to give you an idea of where we're going, is if I go to the Simulate tab, if I choose the settings, I can go through and say how long I want the simulation to be. I think it defaults to like 20 seconds, which is really, really fast. So I tend to make it a little bit longer, like 60 seconds, whatever it is that you want it to be. You can sort of figure out how often you want to do a snapshot every one day, every two days, every five days. Again, it would sort of be relative to how big your total time frame is. Okay. And when you're done with sort of setting up these general parameters, you can say, play it. And what will happen is, in the 3D window, it'll start building the building. Okay, and you can see, like, the slab coming in, and you're seeing the columns coming in. Here come the beams. Here come some beam systems. 
there was a core coming in, probably came in at a sort of bad spot. Then I'm going to put the second floor columns in there, the second floor beams, second floor beam systems. I'm going to build it on up. Here comes the third floor. I'm going to slowly but surely build the building from the ground up. Now, the nice thing about the 4D simulation is it's actually kind of really showing you where you are at every step in the project. So, as you go through and build this up, if you really want to see where you're going to be on April 1st, or you want to see where the building is going to be on May 31st, or whatever it is that you have in mind, or you have it finished running, okay. there's the finished building built in the background there. And you're just stepping through this. And stop it. And I can kind of drag my little slider along and sort of figure out where I want to be February 15th, March 10th, get to a specific spot. And this is actually sort of very useful because I can start using this information for all oh, materials management and figuring out if the right things are ordered that I need on site. If I want to sort of make sure that I can go ahead and rip the beam systems on the second floor, I have to make sure they're available on site, they're cataloged somewhere, maybe just store some information about them. Okay. So, to do this, the key to this whole thing is really, it's all about going through and mapping these task timelines to the activities. Okay. But let's talk about where that actually creates a challenge for you, too. Here's the deal. The way the model information comes in from Revit, okay, and the way your task activities are laid out, okay, when you think about things being organized from a task timeline perspective, are often pretty different from each other. Okay. And really where this is classically an awful lot of work for people is if you need to go through and basically create a lot of selection sets or search sets to go through and map all your different activities, all your different pieces in Revit to two tasks in like uh, Navisworks, it's an awful lot of work. It really gets to be where the art of this comes down to. It gets to be very, very cumbersome. And really, the Navisworks pros, they're the ones who really know how to use that search and pull the criteria to try and pull things together. But it's really quite difficult to do that. So, what I want to actually do is show you something which I think is like the newest thing since sliced bread in terms of actually making your life a lot easier for doing this. Okay? And hopefully, this is a trick you can carry away to really start thinking about how you can work with your BIM model and really get a lot more information in your BIM model. And that's as follows. If we go on back, and let me switch back over to the BIM model that's behind this. Close that on up. Close that bad uh, flash report. Close that on up. And actually, if you wanted to play along in Revit Architecture, do well, you have access to this one? Maybe not. Actually, you do have access to this one. I think. Let me come on back in. We'll see. I'm going to go into Revit Architecture, and here's what I'm going to do. In Revit Architecture, let's think about it this way. As opposed to taking all those elements over and trying to do all that coordination work in Navisworks, okay, if you, as part of your Revit Architecture model, which you have a pretty good control over because you've been doing the modeling, start thinking about assigning different elements to tasks on that side, it actually makes your life a whole lot easier on the Navisworks side. Okay. Sounds a little strange. You go into the Revit, uh, Revit model and you won't find anything that says task ID, but that doesn't mean you can't add it. So let me go ahead and kind of show you what I mean. I'm going to open like that low rise architecture model and just kind of show you kind of really one of the most you know, generally useful things you can do within Revit to really start extending it far beyond just sort of the 3D modeling. And that's actually to start setting up your own parameters to add information to the model that isn't already there. So, for example, I got all these different pieces of the model here. I got walls, doors, windows, and all that type of stuff. And if I go clicking around over here on a wall or something like that, you'll see that there's a lot of information over here available, but there's nothing that really talks about task ID or scheduling or material availability. Or there's all these different fields I might want to sort of store against the data that's in this big model. But, so, what can we do about that? We can actually start extending the Revit model. So let me show you what I have in mind. I have out there somewhere in my world of uh, stuff I stashed away here. Let me come out to my Penn State folder. Let me see if I can get it over there. Team sharing. Where to go? Oh, 
tools and go on out there to pen search. Okay, and here's what's out there in that folder if you want to get to it. Um, we have all sorts of stuff in here. For example, it's like a task timeline. Let me kind of show you what this looks like. This is sort of an Excel spreadsheet, but we can really do this in anything. Again, it can come out of Microsoft Project, it can come out of uh, here or whatever it is. I just actually set up a little Excel spreadsheet that had these comma separated values that sort of said that we're going to start date and a stop date and some older precedents. Just really what the dates are going to be. This is all just sort of managing Excel right now based on duration, stuff like that. So if I go through in this thing and I decide that, oh, that's really going to take 12 days or something like that, it should update the dates on down there. Let's see if it actually does. It'll take 15 days. Hmm. It's still starting out here. Let me take 20 days. That's interesting. It's locked in there somehow. <laughs> really, my duration got leaked right now because I must have done that in the active spreadsheet and these are storing values right now. But I'll go back to 12 now. I'll get that part of the demo. But I basically have a list of different activities and different task IDs. That's the starting point of this thing. So just come up with some task ID that you can use as your, your reference point for associating different uh, room elements. So you'll see I have a 110 is the foundations, 120 is the columns on the first floor, 130 is the beams, 140 is the joists. Okay, let's go back over to the other. I would love to associate 120 and 130 and 130 with these elements. I don't have fields to do it with right now. If I don't have fields and I want to know about the task list, no one ever talks about this, but it's actually one of the best features in Reddit. If you go to the Manage tab, you'll find some fantastic features in here. There's something in here called Project Parameters and Shared Parameters. Let's talk about those. Shared Parameters are basically database values you want to add to the project that can be exported to other projects, other types of file formats. So I can add a shared parameter. I'm creating a new one since the old one this was creating it doesn't exist anymore. I'm going to go create a new file. And I'm going to just call this, oh, I'll put it in my uh, documents folder or something like that, just so I can sort of play with it. And I'm going to call it my, uh, oh, I'm going to call it my Penn State Shared Params. So it's a text file. Okay. We can go through and create some groups of parameters. I can create things like scheduling ones and materials management ones and really all sorts of different groups. We think it's just sort of um, a way of organizing our parameters. And when we do that, we can actually start adding parameters. So I'm going to add a parameter called this task ID. And that's going to be just a, a common one and just a piece of text. Yeah, just something that's a database value you're going to work with. Here. Okay, I've created that shared parameter. Let me kind of save it away. It's still not quite showing up though in the element. So we need to go one step further. Let's create the header. Just to create task ID is something that you can use. Then we go through and we've set up a project parameter. And project parameters is a place where we go through and is basically make the association between our shared parameters and any element that it should apply to. Okay, so for example, I can add a project parameter. Let me grab a shared parameter and I need to go out and sort of find that file. There's the parameter file that I just set up and there's task ID. So I could choose that as the parameter I want to add. Then I choose really which of the different categories I want to assign it to. So this is up to you now to think about really what type of elements you want to assign task IDs to. I'll assign them to things like the structural framing, the structural columns, the walls, anything that's sort of a construction thing. I don't need to assign them to things like rooms or detail items, things that aren't really true construction ID items. It's only the things that I really want, and you can sort of choose it right now, you can add them later if you want to, but I can always put them in the walls, structural framing, foundations, stairs, just anything in this list, which is something that you want to be able to schedule as a construction activity. Okay, so choose the things that you like over there. Okay, mechanical equipment, whatever it is. Say okay with that. Oh, we can also sort of group this thing in some specific area. 
I'm going to put it under identity data. I mean, you can put it wherever you want and have it show up inside the dialog. It's, oh, also, it's going to be an instance parameter. It's an instance parameter because I want to be able to sort of change it on every element, on an element by element basis. So it's to say okay to all that. And what all that did for us is as follows. If I come through now and, for example, choose that wall, and I go scrolling on down in the properties, you'll see it now actually has a task ID field. So, and that's really what we wanted in all this. We wanted to try and get a task ID field in there. So if I go through now and try to go through and associate things, oh, with those first four rows are, what did I decide they were going to be, which I should open a different model, but the first four rows, exterior rows, were going to be like item 150. So what I can do is over here in Revit, I will go to the first floor floor plan. I'd like to go through and associate that 150 with all the different first floor walls. Well, I can select them one at a time and kind of associate it that way. But try to think creatively about how you can do this. One thing you can do is basically just drag through the entire first floor wall. And I'll filter that so I'm only showing the walls. Okay. Now I can assign all of those things to task ID 150. And your goal is really to go through now and in your model just find the elements that you think of as construction items and associate task IDs with all those different items. Okay? And the reason why I'm doing it this way is I just have an a lot easier time selecting and controlling and assigning things in Revit because that's a familiar file format for me. I understand it there. And I do it over in Navisports. Is that stop or is that Yes. We could still do it on a 4 by 4 basis, but the link file, we couldn't actually get to it and associate that value with it. So we're going to have to put it in, in the link file. If, if, if this is the architecture model and the plumbing is linked into it, the root file, the plumbing file, is still kind of like look but not touch. So I wouldn't be able to associate the task ID with it like uh, from the architecture model. If I had the plumbing model, I could go in and do that. But yeah, you can go through and select those on a floor by floor basis. You know, just you know, just using the selection box and choosing the right floor level to really associate the right thing with each other. Yes. So what you got to do is for everything that's going to be a construction sequencing thing is just go back to those project parameters and add that into anything that you need to be able to assign it into. So like the curtain wall system, the curtain panels, the columns, just you know, add all the things in there that you need to be able to assign them to and it will add that field then to those items too. Yeah, what will happen is, what we're going to do is, over in Navis we're going to take all those task IDs and we're going to say, hey, grab all the 110s, grab all the 120s, and simulate those. Everything that didn't have a task ID, it just won't show up in the simulation. Okay, right? so well, that's actually sometimes a good thing, because then you can sort of control what it is you show, what it is you don't show, or you can just only choose some of the things to simulate. Because there's nothing that says you have to simulate all of the things that task ID is. You can sort of choose that and control that a little bit. Okay? So, so to get the idea of like assigning these task IDs, the big thing to carry with this is shared parameters. Go ahead and add things. And I use it for task IDs, but use it for anything you need to sort of extend. It's a super database of elements. Extend that database with any information, whether it's where that piece of information, when it got delivered, when it got ordered, where it's stored on site, who's the last person who installed it, whatever it is, store information and just really use that database for all its work. Okay, because you really have in your BIM model one of the most complete databases of information about the building that exists anyway. And really, we're using it in this way for construction. We're going to go ahead and take this model and pass it on down to the operators of the building and they'll add their own fields to it for tracking maintenance history. And just all the things that we need to really kind of like track it from an FM standpoint. So, so we're all passing BIM models and extending them with information these days. That's kind of the big thing to carry away. Okay. 
So once you've assigned some task IDs, let's go back over to Navisworks and see how this works. Over in Navisworks, when you export that NWC file and you bring it across, that task ID is going to come with it. It's going to be one of the different variables that's uh, available to you. And if I come over here into Navisworks and I start looking at the properties of things, you'll find that one of the different things that's available for the elements is, and I think it's under others, 4D task ID. This is one I created beforehand. But you'll see that I have a bunch of selection sets set up for all the 110 items, all the 120 items, all the 130 items, all the 140 items. They're all set up there. Those are created automatically. If I go to my sets, you'll see that I've created a bunch of search sets. Well, all I've really done with the search set is, let me even show you how the find works, it's just set up something that says, find me all the things with 4D task ID is equal to 130. Find me all the things where all the 4D task IDs are equal to 150. 1230. And what I'm going to propose is that this list is a whole lot easier to manage than trying to do it by setting up you know, exotic search criteria that pull all the columns from the first floor and the second floor. And a little bit easier, I think, to manage in terms of these task IDs because you're thinking of it that way. So what happens is once you set up these search criteria based on the task ID, what you do in the timeline window is I'm going to pull that around so you can see, see it. Let me go to the tasks. This thing's just going to keep on fighting me. Over here on the side, there's this notion of really how we want to attach things. And what we can do is, if I say attach a set, you can go ahead and choose any of the different task IDs and go through and choose the set that you want to attach it to. And that's how, so if I grab all the things that are the uh, first four slabs and foundations, I can go through and attach them to the task ID 110, attach those to 120, and handle the attachment that way. Um, if you really want to get clever about it, there's this whole thing of setting up rules, I'm going to show you what that is, where you can actually go through and automatically map things. You can actually just sort of map things automatically where you can map things from a column name to search selections that could have the same thing. So if we go through and edit that, we can go through and map things from if you have a field that's named 120 because it's part of the task, uh, the CSV file you brought in, okay, you can map that to a search set that has the same name. Okay. And that actually makes it very, very quick work if you want to do it that way. But Getting back to sort of one of your earlier questions, for the data sources, what do I do? I come in over here, let me um, add a data source. What I can do is go out and grab something like a CSV file or a Primavera file, bring it on in, find that CSV file that I want to work with, and kind of go from there in terms of if I bring it on in there, I can sort of map what the different task names are, what the fields are to the different fields in timeline and then kind of make the association. So go through and do that. If you do that, the nice thing is you can really start exploring things in a couple of different interesting ways. There's some ways I want you to sort of think about this in terms of doing task IDs that are sort of really, really powerful look like this. As there's actually, uh, I'm going to show you something on the, the BIM workshop that will help you work with this. One thing we can do is just sort of overall set up the entire project in terms of mapping of these task IDs and doing that sort of stuff and mapping it up that way and just try to get a real quick simulation. But what you find in the simulation is that very quickly you start identifying things that you might want to optimize and change a little bit. So some things you can start thinking about, which are sort of classic construction problems where the 4D simulation sort of runs into problems. All right. So there's this problem where in Revit, you tend to model things as like these compound assemblies that have the core of the wall, the interior of the wall, the exterior of the wall. It's all one big Revit element. And when you actually go through and do the 40 simulation, we don't want all those things coming in at the same time. And because we'll typically do the core of the wall first, we'll put the exterior of the wall on at some point that's appropriate, then we'll go back and put the sheet wrap on the interior of the wall, probably much, much later in the process. Okay. So within Revit, we can do this whole thing where we break things into layers, okay, and then uh, uh, parts, excuse me, I said the call for you break it into parts and then basically assign a different task ID to the 
interior core, the interior cranish, and the exterior, and kind of have them come in at different times. Another way I sort of really like to use this, and we have an example kind of on a website I'll show you that would be useful, is in my simple little 4D simulation, there is kind of a problem built in right now in that as I go through and do the simulation, I basically wait for all of the first four columns to get erected before I start putting in any beams, before I start putting in any joists, before I do anything on the second floor. And if it's a very big building, that's really not very realistic. What we tend to do is put up the columns in this end of the building, and we'll put the beams in, and we'll start putting the columns over here, but as we're putting the middle columns, I we'll start putting the beams over there. And we'll think about these workflows where we can sequence things and have different tasks operating in parallel. Okay. So how can you sort of accommodate something like this? Let me show you. I'll say, go back to this uh, Revit or this Excel spreadsheet. I'll do a little bit of an open here. Let me see, oh, where did it go? It is in the Dropbox. Again, it's in that sort of stuff that we kind of left over there that unfortunately we can't get much to. Education. Oh, I hear you coming on. Go ahead and ask. Schools. And I go to, oops, not Stanford, go back to Penn. Oh, come on. I'm looking for a CSV that's further on down in the process. Search, search, define, start. I'm looking in that scene. Oh, there it is. That's the fine line. Looks like two. Yeah. You can think about doing something a little bit more like this, where really all I'm doing here is I'm breaking all the first four columns and the first four elements. I'm just breaking the building into three different zones. Zone A, B, and C. You can have as many zones as it really makes sense for you to do. And all I'm going to do is sort of have different task IDs, an A, a B, and a C, and for each of the different kind of key activities. And then what that would look like in Revit, in that same sort of sense, what I would do is only go through and select elements on one side. I would say, okay, oh, for those columns over there, those ones over there are, oh, actually, I didn't have it, it's not set up in this one. I'd make those 120A, I'd make the ones in the middle of the building 120B, I'd make the ones over on the right, right end of the building 120C. But what I want to encourage you in terms of thinking about this is having access to the task IDs and be able to kind of work with it pretty directly within Revit, you have a lot more flexibility in terms of playing with it and changing the task IDs and testing out different simulation strategies. Or if you did it all just in search sets with the Navis works, it'd be a lot harder for you to kind of get started with all that. So, now, I know this has whipped by incredibly fast in terms of what's going on, so let me actually point you to a, a good online source where if you want to sort of pursue this, you can go ahead and take a look at it in a little more detail. And, oh, let me kind of just pop on out and kind of show you where it is. If you go to this site, boomcurriculum.autodesk.com, okay? This is a site where several years ago I worked on something with a bunch of the Stanford students where we tried to take all this stuff and put it into little 10 and 15 minute videos that really kind of capture the essence of what we're doing here. So if you go to the BIM curriculum and look down at the bottom, some of the uh, lessons we just added this last year, let me see if I can get on down there on my little squishy screen, include 40 simulation and construction planning. And if you go over there, you'll find three different lessons that try to talk about all this. Just sort of the first one, seven, two, one, that's all about just adding these 4D task IDs and how you set that up as a basic way of getting going. The second one is really the one about location-based scheduling. That's where I take the project apart and say zone A, zone B, and zone C, and walk you through how you can improve the simulation. And you'll find that actually in this little project, which is usually scheduled to take about like six or seven months, you can get like two months off the project pretty quickly. 
just by going through and doing more uh, parallel work as opposed to sort of waiting for everything to be sequential. So we can really start seeing some efficiencies in the whole thing. The, fourth lesson, the third lesson is all just about trying to set up materials management parameters, when things get ordered, when they'll be needed, and trying to use that to kind of track uh, yeah, that you have the information or the items on site for what you need. And if you go there, you get these little videos, you can run a little video, you need to hear oh, my uh, desk is closed for like uh, 10 or 15 minutes and you're reading about this. But the good thing is you can stop it, go back because you missed something, play it over again. This is really good. So if this all went by fast and you should have worried about kind of like that you'd like to use it but it went by too fast, go up to this website. And like uh, binquicken.ios.com, it sort of has the essence of what we're doing here and the data set so you can download them and play with them on your own. It does indeed. So everything from basic good modeling stuff, or just you know, following basic elements, customizing things, working with rendering and visualization. A really good one for your class might be including multidisciplinary coordination. You have modules all about how to use structural modeling, uh, electrical modeling, plumbing modeling, and then key modeling, just all those different things. And then specifically on coordination in your case, that can be in Revit. And then in lesson five, this is identifying and resolving issues. That'd be the, the clash detection and through, uh, through the coordination. So a lot of cool stuff. The first one, lesson one, it's about bringing them in and out of work. The second one is about doing that kind of clash detection using the select success. So if this all went by fast and you piqued your interest, but it's all went by too fast and you want to play with it, fantastic resource in terms of just, you know, there's like hours and hours of good stuff out there that may help you get through some critical little thing that you need for your project. Yeah, does that make sense? Fantastic. Let us go ahead and adjourn for tonight. And if you have any questions with this stuff or you want any help with it in terms of applying it, feel free to send me a note at glencast.autodesk.com and we'll try to set up some time to get together with people here pretty much this Saturday afternoon. Okay, fantastic. <laughs>